Dieter Kurtenbach covers the Bay Area and the Warriors. Thanks for joining me for a couple of minutes. Appreciate it. Yeah, anytime. So let's jump into Draymond Green. This has been a, a fascinating series, by far the most entertaining uh, series of the playoffs so far. And Draymond is never short on drama, but this idea of him coming off the bench uh, has really paid off. What are your thoughts around his decision to to ask Steve Kerr about this and the way that it's ended up being successful? Well, let's be fair. Steve Kerr was coming up with the idea on his own, so it was a good it was a good conversation to have. They both came to that conclusion <laughs> on their own. It helps in the sense that the Sacramento Kings provide a very specific tactical issue to the Warriors, which is Golden State likes to play defensively because these are their two best defenders with Kevon Looney and Draymond Green on the floor together. But Sacramento. We know that they're all about pace and they're all about space. They really spread the floor. Their power forward, which is not even really a position anymore, but if you think about it in those terms, it's Harrison Barnes. Harrison Barnes is a classic wing. Uh, they play four out at the very minimum, a lot of times five out. And when you had Draymond Green and Kevon Looney on the floor at the same time, not only did it stretch the Warriors' defense, maybe put them in positions they didn't want, but it became a real issue for them when it came to spacing on the offensive end. And by putting Jordan Poole into the starting lineup and by treating Draymond Green like a center for the vast majority of the game where he is coming in when Looney is coming out, and yes, they play a little bit together at some points, but it's only when the matchups dictate that to be the best play. By starting Jordan Poole, they get a lot more spacing. This is a pick-and-roll series through and through. While there's a lot of off-ball motion and things like that, these two teams are just getting very direct with the ball in their hands. And by having that spacing, I think it's opened up some things for the Warriors on offense. And Poole needs some credit, too. He has been one of the worst defenders in the NBA this season. He's held his own pretty well over the last couple of games for the Warriors. It's never going to be good, but it's a lot better than it usually is. And by just giving that little bit of extra something, he puts the Warriors in a good position. And Draymond needs some credit as well, on top of just coming up with the idea of the selfless act, if you will, of going to the bench. He's really explored more of the floor in his offensive game. He's done a really nice job, not just in driving to the lane when those opportunities are there, but he's, you know, taking a 16 foot jumper with about four minutes to go in that game five. And it went down. They were calling him Dre Nowitzki after the game in the Warriors locker room, uh, him being able to adapt his game to fit what the Warriors need. That's the hallmark of somebody who has won again and again and again, Draymond Green proving that even when you count him out and I, Count myself as someone who did do that. Uh, he finds a way to get it done. Why did you count him out? He looked old and slow in games one and two. It, it just it, he obviously the tactical stuff that I just went over was really giving him fits. It was giving the Warriors fits, and he looked more like a problem than a solution to the Warriors because you had watched him over the course of not just this past season. But last year's NBA Finals, don't forget, he was put on the bench for stretches, big stretches, big important minutes in last year's NBA Finals. And you're starting to wonder at that point if Draymond Green's best basketball was way behind him. You know that he's on the downside of the career because of just being in the league for 10 years. But you were wondering, it, it, we've all expected, maybe suspected for a long time, that the slide would be significant for Draymond. It would come fast and furious. And if he was on that slide, regular season – he had his moments, but he was generally coasting. And so for him to come out in games one and two and not just get himself suspended for game three, but to play poorly in general, in my opinion, over those two games, rarely having you know, a lot of turnovers, looking lost on offense, kind of in a weird no man's land on defense, making plays here and now, here and then, but nothing that was changing the game. Um, it, it just it, it looked like he was not a man for this series. And again, you compound it with everything that we had seen in the regular season last year's playoffs, knowing that it's a contract year for him. Whew, it, it was it was tough to buy into Draymond Green coming into that game four. But again, this is how Draymond stays, got in the league, stays in the league and is going to be in the Hall of Fame one day. He finds a way to get it done. Uh, he changed his offensive game. He's playing as a wing on offense. And defensively, he, he embraced the challenge of being a full-time center. And he's been so wonderful when guarding even De'Aaron Fox. He, he's really showing the full breadth of his defensive skills. Warriors had to put him in the position to do it, but Draymond Green had to get the job done once he was there. What do you expect from him in game six in terms of offensive production? 
It's tough. I, I am not getting a good vibe. And my vibes, uh, vibe checks are probably not worth much these days. But uh, the Warriors seem to do a lot of patting themselves on the back after game five because they did win on the road, which is such an innocuous thing to prior Warriors teams. But to this Warriors team was an accomplishment of all accomplishments. They call that the biggest win of the year. And it's understandable. The circumstances, all that, I get it. But it, it, it felt to me coming out of game five that the Warriors thought the job was done. And I have, I watched a lot of Sacramento Kings basketball this year. Obviously they're a a regional team. You get a lot of, you know, reports from up North about how they're doing. I'm in on Sacramento. I thought they had a really good chance in this series. I don't doubt that the Warriors are the prohibitive favorites to win it now up three, two with a game at chase center on Friday night. But don't count these Kings out. I feel like that is just something that is setting yourself up for failure. This team has some real gumption. De'Aaron Fox is playing with a broken finger. It didn't look like it affected them at all. I thought that the Kings maybe got a little bit drowned out by the Warriors' experience in Game 5, but that's not something that can't be overcome. They are toe-to-toe with this team. They had a 2-0 series lead, and if the Warriors don't bring their A game with Draymond Green leading the way emotionally, and I, I, I just suspect that that might be the case, the Sacramento Kings will take full advantage. I, I feel like a lot of people, not just the Warriors, but outside of the Warriors' sphere, felt like, well, the Warriors won game three. That's going to do it. If Sacramento gets game six, they get a game seven at home in Sacramento. That building is absurd. I think they'd like their chances in that. All they got to do is bring it in game six. And if the Warriors let their guard down just a little bit, the margins are so tight in this series, that could be enough. Why has Golden State struggled so profoundly on the road this year? Uh, Great question. I've asked it roughly two dozen times uh it's it's a conundrum to everybody i think it's probably an amalgamation of like seven or eight things and just one or two of them shows up every time they play a road game so when they fix something over here it gets broken over here and they're just not as good of a team as they have been in the past right we hold the warriors up kind of speak about them in in reverent tones this is not the team pre-pandemic that was a guarantee to go to the NBA finals every year. That was as good as any team as we've ever seen in the history of the NBA, at least in my estimation, given how they had to build that team in this era with the rules and salary cap and all that jazz that didn't really exist in the pre-dynastic days. Um, This team won the title last year. No one's taken anything away. It was an incredible run. They had a lot of things break their way on the path. They had a great path to begin with. They were a darn good team. But they were one of many teams, I thought, out of the West that could win the title last year. They just came out on top, and then they beat the Boston Celtics with their experience. This team is not as good as last year's team. It's nowhere near as good as the teams that, again, went to five straight NBA finals. And so there is just margin for error. And when you don't bring, you know, you don't bring the proper intensity or the proper respect to games in the regular season on the road, and the Warriors openly admitted to doing that up until the very end of the season, when you don't defend the three-point line very well, when you don't get to the free throw line very well, you don't force the issue on offense. You just can go down the list. They don't offensive rebound well. They don't, you know, to control the ball very well. And just every night it would be one of these things and it would kill them and game five was the first time all season they had beat a full strength playoff team on the road that's it they had beaten cleveland in the regular season cleveland didn't have uh, donovan mitchell they beat the sacramento kings at the end of the season the sacramento kings were resting all their starters because they already had their seed locked up game five was the first time they beat a playoff team on the road just because they've done it once though doesn't mean that you got to like them in the possible game seven it, it's just not they're just not as good as they were in the past it's not to say they can't win the title they absolutely can they have experience that no one else can match and if you get into a battle of who has the most experience the warriors are going to win every time but the margins are such to where again you find yourself in a scenario where the warriors might not even get to tap into that experience because they're playing from behind they play from behind on the road so often uh, it's just it's just a tighter, tighter NBA, and the Warriors are just one of the teams that can win a title, as opposed to being the team every year that you expected would win the title. 
we've seen a lack of effort, uh, stamina at times, uncharacteristic mistakes at times uh, from this team. And, and yet, as you point out, you know, they are the team with more playoff experience, which you would think is really valuable at a time like this. Did you see a lack of playoff experience from Sacramento in that game three? And do you expect that if this does get pushed to seven, that that could potentially be a, a factor that would shift things in Golden State's favor, despite the fact that they have struggled on the road i think the warriors would like to think that for sure um and i i do i did see some lack of experience it's one of those things too that if you, if you want to put the label of oh experience for positive or experience for negative you can pretty much ascribe anything that happens in a game to that sort of stuff that said the warriors operated they, they were clinicians in the fourth quarter of game five they knew exactly what it was they wanted to do they knew where their spots were they ran their pet plays and they attacked the weaknesses of the kings it was like it was all building up to that exact moment whereas the sacramento kings i thought rushed a lot of stuff and looked a little bit herky-jerky and with the aaron fox hobbled and by the way well defended by gary payton the second in the fourth quarter of that game uh it, it, they looked lost without him just sort of doing it all for them but I don't count that dude out at all. If I had to make a bet, I'd say that was his one bad fourth quarter, De'Aaron Foxes. And if the Warriors find themselves in game six, needing to beat De'Aaron Fox in the clutch, find themselves in a game seven, needing to beat De'Aaron Fox in the clutch, I don't think that's a bet that I would want to take the Warriors on, even with all that experience, because that dude is cold blooded. He <laughs> is one of one. He is so fun to watch. Uh, yes, the experience is great. The Warriors don't freak out in tight scenarios but it's it's just not the same team that it was and experience can only get you so far and we've seen them be a team in the past that certainly relied on the three especially in those moments where they need a momentum swing or everything's on the line in the playoffs they've been so reliable from beyond the perimeter but in this series in particular shooting 33 percent from three which is down from what they averaged in the regular season how big of a factor do you think that could potentially be if they get into a tight situation in a game six or even a game seven it's everything. I mean, it, the series has been decided by the three point shots to the point where now the margin, you look at <laughs> the Sacramento and the Warriors, they're just chucking. I mean, it, it's not beautiful basketball that's being played here. It's fun. It's entertaining, but it ain't beautiful. This is no one. This is no coaching clinics, ideal series here. Uh, it's a lot of three pointers and not a lot of them are advised, but it comes down to like offensive rebounds and turnovers because there's so many threes being shot. And, and maybe Sacramento has a, a hot game. Maybe the Warriors have a hot game. No one can really guess on that sort of stuff. Uh, it, it's been huge. And ultimately you expect in the playoffs, three point shooting percentage is going to go down. You expect it to fall a little bit because the defense is going to get better. Uh, it's probably not ideal for the Warriors. If we do want to look forward that the three point shooting percentage hasn't been all that great against the Sacramento team. That isn't all that great on defense. Uh, maybe that's the first couple of games of the series really bearing out now over the course of the series in terms of the numbers. But uh, the Warriors, the Warriors have gotten away with it, right? And they, they won close games here. Uh, I would give the Kings credit for this. Clay Thompson and Steph Curry in games one and two, both times hit major league back-breaking threes that you would just never expect. And I've seen a hundred times other teams just quit on, just go, well, it's not our night. Can't do it. Steph Curry and Clay Thompson said, what's what? That was not how the Sacramento Kings went about doing their business. They absolutely fought back. Nothing but respect for them. They did a wonderful job in those two games. And it's why they still have a chance in this series, despite the fact the Warriors have run off three straight. How would you assess the play of Andrew Wiggins in this series? Solid, really good. Um, it, it, could it be better? Sure. We saw what it looked like last year, and it was spectacular last year. He was the second best player on this team. I don't know if he qualifies as that in this series, but necessary might be the better word for all of this. If the Warriors didn't have Andrew Wiggins, they wouldn't have a chance. The NBA playoffs are all about two-way players. And as you know, good as Draymond was in game five, as, as good as Kevon Looney has been on the offensive side, uh, is, is you know positive relatively uh, as Clay Thompson has been and Jordan Poole have been on defense. And, and we know what Steph Curry is like. The Warriors have one two-way dude, and it's Andrew Wiggins. And they can count on him to go for 17 to 22 points a night to play really good defense, though I, I think that it's gotten better as the series has gone on just because he's – kind of getting his legs back under him after missing 
months and then just hopping in for the playoffs, which is absurd in and of itself. Um, he's, he's just been really good without him. They can win a game without Draymond Green. We saw that. They can win games without Gary Payton the second. We've seen that. Without Andrew Wiggins, the Golden State Warriors would be in Cabo San Lucas or Cancun right now. There's just no two <laughs> ways about it. He has been he has been immense for them and a steadying force on a team that needs as many of those as they can get. With that being said, is he your X factor for game six? Who who are you really looking at? Which player is going to make the difference here? I'll go I'll go back to two guys I just mentioned. And they're not the guys who are going to get the headlines. They're not the guys who you're even going to notice uh, probably during the regular course of a game. But Kavon Looney has been a rebounding machine. And Sacramento clearly made it a priority in games one and two that they were going to destroy the Warriors on the glass. And because of that, the Kings were getting up 10, 15 more shots per game in those two games than the Warriors did. And when you're just shooting three-pointers all the time, 10 to 15 is a massive margin. That, that, that's the difference. I mean, the series comes down to who gets up more shots. And uh, I wish it was more complicated than that, more interesting than that. But who gets up more shots? And so not just turnovers, but offensive rebounds as well. Massive. And Kavon Looney has been immense on the glass and has given the Warriors a little bit of something on the offensive side, driving to the lane. He picked up a little bit of what Draymond was putting down in games four and five, and has been doing that himself. We remember how good he was in last year's Western Conference Finals, how solid he's been over the years for championship Warriors teams. But uh, he, he seems to be an X factor for me. And if we want to get even a little bit deeper, look to Gary Payton the second, who they play as a power forward, despite being six foot two, he gets on the glass. He's the guy who's, you know, cutting in from the dunker spot. His constant movement is really key for a Warriors team that now that they're running a lot more pick and roll, find themselves standing around a little bit more than you would expect for Golden State. Peyton breaks up that ice a little bit, kind of gets into the fascia of the defense a little bit and creates lanes despite not really being an offensive threat himself. His work ethic, along with you know, Kavon Looney's work ethic on the boards, Gary Payton's work ethic on just working through a defense on the offensive side, absolutely critical if the Warriors want to get where they want to get and win game six. How much discussion has there been around the the end of this championship window, this era of Steph and Draymond and, and Clay Thompson? Um, is that something that – is that a narrative, a storyline that's kind of ever-present out there? Mm-hmm. It pops up every now and again, for sure. I I wouldn't call it ever present because in a weird way, we've already seen the demise of the Golden State Warriors. This is almost like a new thing. It's very familiar. It has the same characters, but no one expected them to win the title last year. And, And to be clear, Bob Myers and Steve Kerr, the president of basketball operations and head coach, went into the playoffs on fully understanding last year, oh, we're not winning the title this year. We're not good enough. And then they won the title anyway, which maybe that's a credit to the experience. Um, This feels like a new thing. This feels, yes, it could very well end tomorrow, but when you've already dealt with the Kevin Durant saga as it was, everything sort of pales in comparison in when it as it pertains to trauma and sort of last dance energy and all that. So it hasn't really creeped in as much, but as I mentioned earlier, Final year of Draymond Green's contract is a player option for next year. Clay Thompson going into the uh, this is the penultimate year of his contract. The new collective bargaining agreement is going to make it way tougher for the Warriors to bring in sort of those fringe players that really make the difference in series like this. Um, this could very well be it, which is why you got to savor every moment you can get with these Warriors. And we don't know if that's going to be 10 more games, 20 more games, or two. Uh, it, it, it is – We'll talk about it a lot more once it's done, but after you do the Durant thing and you play an entire season knowing it's all about to blow up and injuries and drama and Instagram, it's just a hot mess. I don't think anyone's too interested in sort of rehashing that (laughs) with this Warriors team, though it very well well is in the back of everybody's minds that you never know how long this thing is going to last, and maybe they're already well out of gravy on the gravy train. What's your sense? I mean, do you think that they get out of this series after stringing together a couple of really impressive efforts? How far can they go? They could lose in seven or go all the way. I wish I knew. I've watched this team the entire year. Uh, Every day is a new thought on the Golden State Warriors. They're either the worst basketball team I've ever seen or certain to win the title. I can't tell you. 
I can't tell you. And the worst part is, I don't think anyone in the facility can tell you. I don't think any other media member can tell you. I don't think any fan can tell you. Uh, they're not bipolar or anything like that. They just, they, they're just not as good as they used to be. And maybe we're anchored to this old notion of the Warriors. Uh, Sacramento Kings are a damn good basketball team. They're the three seed. They get the game seven at home. If it gets to a game seven, uh, the Warriors are a team that needed to make the play, needed to win the last day of the year to even make the real playoffs. They could have very well been a play in tournament team, in which case they are absolutely in Cabo or, or Cancun right now. Anywhere else, Los Angeles, who's to say? Uh, it's they have they have what it takes to win it all, especially with Milwaukee now out in the Eastern Conference. I don't think they should fear the Philadelphia 76ers. I don't think that they should be too worried about the Miami Heat or the New York Knicks or just go down the list. Uh, the Western Conference, Phoenix is a really tough team. Denver would be a tough out. They're all tough outs, but the Golden State Warriors have four banners in the uh, in the rafters. They've been to six NBA Finals now. They've done everything and ev anything. Their young players from last year have some experience under their belts now. You've seen this with Moses Moody, who's been really good in this series. Big surprise to everybody that he's even playing, much less playing well. Um, they could do anything. But I have a lot of respect for the Sacramento Kings. So to, to just sort of sim to the end and say, oh, well, they'll beat the you know, Warriors will beat the Lakers or the Grizzlies. And then they'll play the Suns and they'll probably beat them, too, because you can't trust Chris Paul. Do all that stuff is to discount the possibility that Sacramento wins back to back games, which they've already done in this series. And yeah. uh, and, and I, I think Sacramento has been absolutely overlooked by everybody just oh it's a it's a happy story it's a fun story you know that we're also anchored to this notion that the sacramento kings stink year in and year out they don't stink this year they're a really good basketball team so anything i say for the warriors should also apply to the sacramento kings which is a wild thing for me to say out loud but here we are it, it's anybody's ball game in the nba this year which is going to make it a hell of a lot of fun uh and i'll say this for the nba if the warriors do advance and they get the Grizzlies or the Lakers next, that is going to be a ratings bonanza for the league. They are going to be so happy with that, and uh, I think we'll all enjoy it pretty immensely. That, that's two just firecracker series if there ever was one. <laughs> it's been entertaining so far. It sounds like Golden State, out by your estimation, still has plenty of work to do if they want to reach that next round and a meeting with one of those potentially uh, star-laden teams. Dieter Kurtenbach, thanks so much for the time. I appreciate it. Uh, best of luck the rest of the way. Hopefully they can get this thing done and appreciate the time. Anytime. Thanks.